morning. Uh, am I heard? Please somebody confirm that you can hear. Uh, I received the no problem. Uh, it happened. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so some of you wrote that there were uh, problems with audio yesterday. Uh, so if there are any problems, please let me know. I uh, hope that today there will be no problems. Uh, in fact, I received this only from one of you, so I hope it's, uh, it was something local. Uh, all right, good morning. Uh, so we are continuing the studies of uh, the uh, Lagrangian trajectory. Uh, uh, Lagrangian trajectories and how we describe their behavior below the viscous scale. And uh, today I will already give you some concrete examples of uh, physically relevant properties. So we will speak about magnetic field growth in turbulence and uh, about, ah, excuse me, uh, regarding the chat, uh, it turned out that there is a more intelligent way of uh, gathering your names. So there's no need uh, to write in the chat that you are here. Uh, well, I actually requested for that and uh, there's a much simpler way. Uh, some of you uh, advised, I think, I hope I'll pronounce the name correct. It was Asgir, I think, uh, who proposed that there's another way to do it. Uh, all right, so uh, please let us start from uh, any questions you might have on uh, previous lectures. Uh, please make sure that you understand everything which you heard so far. So until today, we talked quite a lot about uh, turbulence, stressing the intermittency. You had two different approaches uh, to intermittency. One approach via the multifractal hypothesis, which tells you that uh, further exponents uh, of the flow in the limit of infinite Reynolds number are uh, well defined. There is a non trivial finite interval of scaling exponents of velocity. It holds in the formulation which I gave uh, per realization. So it's uh, something which is not statistical. Today we will hopefully see uh, that if you speak of it probabilistically, multifractal model is almost tautological. Uh, then we spoke about multifractality as it comes from uh, properties of uh, dissipation field in the limit of zero viscosity or infinite Reynolds number. This field becomes a multifractal measure and uh, we did not speak much about what are multifractals besides giving some definitions of dimension, which uh, I hope you could understand and they were kind of intuitive. So the main, uh, so when you work with fractals in turbulence, you can actually use these definitions which I gave you and not worry about other things because uh, that's how they appear in formulas. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to have more uh, understanding, you need to consider a general theory of fractals and multifractals. And there you will see other definitions of fractal dimensions. In fact, this infinity of fractal dimensions in the case of multifractals that we will consider. Uh, however, when you consider fractals as they are, uh, you will see that there are many definitions of fractal dimension. Uh, well, not so many, but this kind of uh, no unique definition. So uh, then if you want, you may uh, see what is the connection between these definitions. Sometimes they are the same things, sometimes they are not. Uh, so we will not go into those details. Uh, all right, so let us uh, then consider uh, complete the study of Lapinov exponent. So we defined Lapinov exponent as so you have this, let me make an effort and draw this picture. So you have turbulence, which is excited at some uh, scale and capital. Viscosity is assumed to be negligible at this scale, which means that Reynolds number is a large number. 
and large means really large. So it's typically you want it to be well 10 to power three uh, at least. Well, because uh, well for various reasons you don't want it to be say 10 because uh, for 10 or 100 you often have uh, not the regime of developed turbulence. You want the inertial range to be large, which means that you want to have many scales over which. Uh, the viscosity is negligible. So the, so to say, cascade of energy starts, which means that uh, large scale fluctuation injected by the forcing uh, creates smaller scale fluctuations, uh, which we refer to as eddies. And they are created until they reach a small scale, which we designated with eta. And it is actually a fluctuating scale, which is locally defined as the con by the condition that velocity difference across this eddy, uh, delta V times eta divided by nu is equal to one or of order one. So we demand that local Reynolds number is one, which is the condition that the viscous term in Navier-Stokes equations is of the same order as the nonlinear term. And this is where we hope the flow to be smooth. Now, I was... Uh, asked about uh, by email uh, about uh, what happens below the viscous scale because uh, the usual, well, uh, you all have different perspectives. So one of the perspectives at what happens below the viscous scale is that the kinetic energy of turbulence dies and there's nothing. So what it is that we are considering. So in what sense uh, this is true, in what sense it's not. So. If you plot the spectrum of kinetic energy, you find that uh, this spectrum has this maximum at inverse uh, of uh, pumping scale. Then there is this uh, Kolmogorov scaling, which in fact has a correction. And you can, with what you learned so far, you can in fact uh, know the sign of this correction. So let us do it as kind of an exercise uh, to know what is the sign of delta. I'll do it in a moment. Uh, and then at the scale, which is uh, viscous, inverse of viscous scale, the spectrum starts to decay quickly. Now you can ask, what is the viscous scale which you need to use here? Uh, you can use Kolmogorov scale, which I remind that Kolmogorov scale is nu cubed over epsilon to power one over four. So at realistic uh, viscous, uh, well, uh, Reynolds numbers, you can with no problem use here the Kolmogorov scale. And you will find that beyond this scale, the spectrum decays fast. Now, there are other phenomena which I think you need to know uh, that in fact, a viscous scale starts to be uh, uh, felt uh, already at smaller wave numbers than the inverse Kolmogorov scale because uh, of so-called bottleneck phenomenon, uh, which is uh, related to the fact that uh, the nonlinearity in Navier-Stokes equations is quadratic. So you have, uh, so to say, triadic interaction. Uh, so different, uh, so say two Fourier modes create uh, amplitude for the third moment, which is simply, uh, you can see, if you consider Fourier transform of the Navier-Stokes equations, you find that this becomes dt v of k plus uh, i uh, integral uh, v k minus k prime. I will not write all details of the indices. I want only to give you an idea. Uh, so you have this type of convolution in Fourier space and that is, so the mean of triad interaction is that if you have not zero Fourier amplitude at some wave number and at another wave number, then they can combine and produce finite derivative for the third wave number. So uh, rotations with say K1 and K2 create some K3, uh, which is the triad interaction. So uh, when you approach the viscous range, you have the situation that this tried interaction 
when it, uh, it wants to involve wave numbers which are already in the viscous range, is already changed by viscosity. So uh, this leads to certain pileup of energy near the viscous scale. So it's not that you simply have that K minus five thirds plus some small correction becomes, uh, say, exponent, stretched exponential decay, which is typically probably the decay in the viscous range. Uh, you find that there is some intermediate thing which you need to consider in more detail. Uh, so typically in the viscous range, you can fit the data with uh, stretched exponential laws of this type. Uh, I will not go into these details. Uh, there is no good derivation of uh, this stretched exponential laws. Moreover, you can make many different fits with not a problem. And it's up to you to large extent which uh, fit as a function you use there. Uh, so we don't have any well-defined law of spectrum decay in the viscous range of which we could be certain that yes, this is the law because you could use this law or maybe you could use another law and describe the same data. We simply are by far not there. We also don't know if you want to make this type of uh, ansatz uh, to fit the data. Uh, we also don't know the dependence of all these constants delta C and beta on the Reynolds number. We know that they do depend on Reynolds number. There is a reference which I can give to those who are interested. So these are again kind of open problems of modern theory of turbulence. Uh, so let us fix the sign of delta, which... Uh, so you want to know if intermittency is going to increase the spectrum or decrease. So to begin with, how you know that uh, there is a Kubagorov uh, law of spectrum decay is wrong. Uh, well, you start with the fact that uh, you have this law of which we talked about that second order correlation function. So if you can see the squared velocity difference at distance r, average it's given by r to some power which we defined as zeta of uh, argument which is two where two is simply the order of moment so uh, you can uh, i remind you that we spoke of anomalous scaling as anomalous scaling exponents zeta of k in this way and for k equal two you get this quality so uh, and then we uh, as we considered, zeta of k has the property that at three it, it is equal to one by Kolmogorov law, which is four fifths law, which is example of turbulence. And then there is convexity, which means that it goes somehow in this way. Now, what this means is that convexity, as compared with Kolmogorov scaling, where Kolmogorov scaling is simply this linear law. So Kolmogorov scaling zeta of k of k, here it's k capital, is k over 3. So it tells you that, so convexity tells you that zeta of 2 must be larger than Kolmogorov value. So it must be larger than 2 over 3. Okay, now what this tells you is that second order structure function of velocity of this delta V square, in fact, is smaller than uh, in Kolmogorov theory due to intermittency, because you get, uh, so if you write it with dimensional variables, this law, if you write it up to factors of order one, and not only consider the scaling in R, is that v squared, this large scale velocity, and then you have r over l to power zeta of two, which you can write as delta v squared of r, as you would find in K41 theory, times r over l to power zeta of two minus two over three. So this gives you that because zeta of two minus two over three is positive number, 
it tells you that in fact it is smaller than Kolmogorov value. This factor is smaller than one, and moreover, uh, as you increase the inertial range, you, it, it will actually go to zero. So uh, you get that uh, second order structure function of turbulence is depleted due to intermittency, and the reason is that intermittency increases the uh, regions of calm turbulence where these differences are small. Uh, at the same time, if you would consider K which is larger than three, you would find the other way around that uh, zeta of K there is smaller than Kolmogorov value and all structure functions with order higher than three are increased by intermittence. So the general law is that if you consider order smaller than three, intermittency decreases the structure functions. And if you consider order larger than three, intermittency increases the structure functions in comparison with Kolmogorov theory. So if it is decreased, it means that there is smaller energy at a given wave number because wave uh, spectrum of turbulence is Fourier transform of pair correlation function. Uh, if you don't know that, please uh, learn this fact that spectrum can be written as pair correlation function of turbulence, Fourier transform. And if you want spherical normalization, you need to divide it by k squared, which is the k minus five to three. So you find from this that this is uh, the energy at given wave number must be smaller than Kolmogorov prediction, which means that this delta must be positive, or you can write it. Uh, so it's uh, the spectrum is depleted in comparison with Kolmogorov theory. Uh, ah, all right. Uh, so I see that some of you uh, didn't. Uh, well, so there's no need today to tell in the chat that you are here and also in the sequence. All right, so, uh, so finishing the answer to this question, which was uh, actually posed by Nikolai Antonov, uh, we, uh, the spectrum does decay quickly, uh, rapidly in the uh, viscous range. However, that does not mean that below the viscous scale, there is no inhomogeneous flow. So the flow is still inhomogeneous. It is simply, so to say, from the viewpoint of uh, particles which are below the viscous scale. So if you thought of, uh, say, you are some, uh, you could sit on some particle with radius A, which is much smaller than local viscous scale, then the flow around you would look as a linear flow, which would uh, be determined and change over scale, which is eta, which is much larger than the scale on which you are. And this is in fact situation of water droplets and clouds. And you would find that uh, from your viewpoint, the flow around is a linear flow with some uh, random coefficients, which are given by this matrix R grand V. So the fact that you are below the viscous scale doesn't mean that there is no flow there. It only means that the flow there is large scale flow, where large scale from the viewpoint of uh, creatures which live on these scales is viscous scale of turbulence and not large scale of turbulence as injection scale. Okay, so this is about this uh, thing that uh, you do need to know this because uh, for obvious reasons we study things below viscous scale. For many years, these things were uh, often disregarded. Uh, of course, there were works by Bachelin and by Krakner, by many. Uh, however, the uh, focus was, of course, on the inertial range. Uh, today, many applications demand actually the viscous range, and this is why we are considering. It. All right, so if there are no, uh, so this is uh, kind of response to the question of uh, Nikolai, which also allows us to find, uh, to speak about some other aspects of intermittency and modding. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to raise this from the board. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, or remarks, 
please do that at this point. Uh, we return to the lab of correspondence, which are uh, one of the main characteristics of the flow below the viscous range, below the viscous range. All right. Okay. Uh, lambda one, as we saw, is you consider pair of particles below the viscous range, a bit below the viscous scale or in the viscous range, and you find that the particles typically uh, diverge exponentially, so the distance between the particles changes according to this law. Now, there is something to be understood here, uh, which you need to think about and think about uh, quite uh, well, really uh, take uh, care to think about it, that you consider completely random flow in the sense that, uh, well, Toplands is a flow which we cannot predict in any way. It has good random properties like ergodicity and other types of properties. So uh, a priori, all properties of motion inside these flows are random. At the same time, there is uh, a robust uh, characteristics of motion of particles inside turbulence which is this Lapinov exponent, which is a completely deterministic quantity, which uh, does not uh, depend on realization in the sense that you have, say, in front of you turbulent flow, which means that you have at a given moment of time. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have spatial structure of the flow at a given moment of time. Now think that you have it at all times. Uh, so you have, uh, in the full glory, the velocity field of turbulence, which is a function of space and time. Now, wherever you are in this time and space, so if symbolically this is time and space, you take at some moment of time, pair of trajectories, and you watch how they diverge in turbulence, and you find always the same number, lambda one, irrespective of when you started the experiments, and. Uh, where you place this pair of trajectories. Now, this is, of course, uh, quite a remarkable fact that uh, you have uh, some deterministic law about turbulence. And in fact, moreover, this law is simpler than what is found in deterministic laws, in deterministic flows, because in deterministic flows, you would always, you would often find that this quantity depends not trivially on where the trajectory start and what was the initial orientation. Uh, and this is one of the things about randomness that randomness in fact often simplifies things. And the reason of course is the law of large numbers. So we saw that this quantity can be in fact represented as time average of uh, a process which is, uh, uh, which has the form of a Gordian theorem. And this is ultimately the reason why there is no dependence on initial condition uh, in this limit. Uh, at the same time, it's useful to, um, to employ this property of independence of initial conditions. So uh, lambda one is the so-called self-averaging quantity. Now, what does it mean? It means that uh, you consider this lambda one, and it is uh, something which, in principle, depends on uh, spatial position. So you can write that lambda one is a limit as uh, time goes to infinity of this one over t. And let us write directly, uh, explicitly, the dependence on initial position. So we designate here the initial position of one of the particles by X, okay? So then the dependence on X comes 
from the fact that sigma i k is a function of, let me introduce the arguments of this function explicitly. It is a function of time and the trajectory around which we consider uh, perturbations. So we consider small deviations from this trajectory, which issues at x. And this is expressed by these formulas that this is gradient of velocity field evaluated on the moving trajectory of, of fluid particle, where moving trajectory of fluid particle is defined by this law that time derivative of trajectory is equal to the local velocity field and x is initial position of this trajectory. So once you realize that, you realize that sigma depends on initial position because, so let me at this point erase the other trajectory. So you have a trajectory which starts at X. You evaluate gradients of velocity along this trajectory. Then you fix the vector N, which also depends on X because you define it with the help of equation, which uh, terms do depend on x because sigma depends here on x. So in this way, you can tell that this uh, function of time and sigma n depends on the initial uh, position of the trajectory. You can at this point forget about the other trajectory and consider lambda one as a property of one trajectory of uh, of single trajectory of uh, fluid flow. And this is the property which you typically use in numerical simulations because you, uh, as I told you, you take gradients of flow on the trajectory, you produce the vector n, you derive from that this process and you average it over time. Uh, however, as we discussed, averaging over time is uh, can be problematic, it can converge poorly. So then you do this thing that you tell this, that because this property as ergodic theorem tells us, depends, uh, is independent of X up to possible X, which have zero spatial volume, then this lambda one is actually equal to its average over space. And this is why we refer to it as self-averaging quantity because this quantity point-wise is equal to the value which is its average, okay? It's sometimes lambda one is called almost constant because it is a property, a function of space, which would be defined by this limit, which is known to be constant everywhere up to a set with zero spatial volume. So when you perform integration over space, points with uh, zero spatial volume do not contribute this integral. And this is why this is equality. Now, what is the utility of this equality? It is that at this point, you can already interchange the orders of average over space and time. And in this way, you would help very much to yourself to find the uh, lambda one from numerical simulations. So you assume that you can interchange the order of integra integration and limits, which is uh, not a problematic assumption in the case which we are considering. And then you can rewrite it as actually average of space average of n sigma n of x dx over omega, where I remind you that omega capital is the total volume of the domain of the flow. So what you find in this way is that you have already uh, something which is, uh, you would think would converge much faster because of this spatial average. So what this means is that at each po point in time, what you do, so this is a function of time. So it's function of time and of space which means that you consider ensemble, effectively you put a pair of trajectories at random in space initially, and 
you simply average over different of the histories of different players. Okay, so you can think of spatial averaging, of course, as simply throwing at random a pair in space, making it a large number of times, and then averaging over this ensemble of pairs is equivalent to the space averaging here. And in this way, you get a quantity which converges fast, and you can use it, and you can also use combination of these. So you can uh, put at random a, a pair of particles in space, and then you put another pair and you put certain number of pairs. It doesn't matter which number you average over pairs and you average over time. And you continue this procedure until you simply have a convergent quantity as simple as that. And you can be certain that this will be this number one. And finally, we discussed with you that the result which you would obtain in this way would be that lambda one times Kolmogorov time, where Kolmogorov time is square root of nu divided by average energy dissipation rate per unit volume of turbulence, is going to be some constant. And I will tell you in a moment how I fix it, times Reynolds to some power delta, which is a small power. So delta is probably of uh, something like 0.04. We do not know that uh, power yet. Uh, it's an open uh, question. Uh, the best experiments uh, data which we have involves only three Reynolds numbers from which you cannot fix the law at all. Moreover, we might still be at, uh, so the Reynolds numbers which are available in numerical simulations might, might be so small that it will still not obey this uh, uh, power law, which is only true in the limit of large Reynolds numbers. So there are all sorts of uh, delicate things which you need to talk about. Uh, and if you don't know them, you might have all sorts of problems in simulations. So I'm uh, making an effort to tell you everything which can be an issue. So, uh, this is about lambda one and it actually helps you already to uh, solve some physical problems and let me start with a problem of uh, so i'll give you today uh, two examples so one example would be magnetic field in ideal uh, flow understood as flow with zero magnetic resistivity and the other would be uh, polymers and turbulence so let me start with a magnetic field. Uh, you consider the uh, conduct a conducting fluid, which uh, typically you have, say, uh, well, electrons and uh, kind of sometimes you can speak of plasma in this way. I'll turn off and turn on the video in order to fix the camera. Uh, so. Uh, you can see the magnetic field, which means that uh, you, uh, because we have conducting fluid, it, it is assumed to be neutral overall. So then you have a current, electric current, and what you can derive then from uh, Maxwell equations is that magnetic field obeys this equation. So B is notation for magnetic field. And you find that uh, in the case of uh, zero magnetic resistivity, you have this law. Now, in reality, there is also always finite magnetic resistivity, which we will not consider at the moment, which would provide, provide this uh, mag uh, magnetic terms. So this law is magnetic diffusivity. Uh, all right, so we look at this equation and we find this uh, that this equation tells us that uh, magnetic field lines are frozen in the flow. So this is a famous conclusion from magnetohydrodynamics, uh, which has a lot of applications in astrophysical context and also in some earthly uh, context. Uh, are frozen in the flow. Now, what does that mean? It means this, that this equation is in fact quite simple. 
because if you consider magnetic field in the Lagrangian frame, so you define B of T X as, uh, so let me, well, I need to distinguish these two. So let us call it Lagrangian, which is magnetic field evaluated at the moving position of the fluid particle, which was initially located at point X in space. Then you find immediately from this equation that Lagrangian magnetic field, so magnetic field in Lagrangian frame obeys ordinary differential equation rather than uh, the uh, uh, partial differential equation. Moreover, you recognize that this is the same metric sigma which we already encountered because you have here grad V evaluated at moving position of fluid particle. So you get this equation. Uh, and what this tells you is immediately that if you start with some uh, configuration of magnetic field, where say you have a magnetic field at time equals zero, you have some initial direction of magnetic field at point X, then it will evolve so that if you consider Lagrangian trajectory, which issues out of this point X, then the vector V will evolve in the same way as vector R. So uh, B of T Q T X will uh, be given by R of T, which we considered previously, condition that R at zero is B of T X. So it is in this sense that you can tell that uh, magnetic field lines uh, become actually material lines of the fluid. So if you imagine that there is some matter along this line element, it would simply be stretched in the same way as actual matter of the fluid. Are there any uh, questions or remarks on this? Is it understood? Um, All right. Uh, can anybody comment? Let me have a look. All right. Uh, okay. So everything is understood. Okay. All right. So then uh, you get immediately the conclusion that as time goes to infinity, limit of 1 over t logarithm of magnetic field which you evaluate on the position of the particle uh, you can divide it by the initial value uh, let me write to it now of course the denominator is needed only uh, for dimensional reasons because logarithm of any constant divided by time tends to zero. So this limit equals the same constant lambda one. Okay, so without much effort, knowing the properties of uh, material lines of the flow, which means that, uh, so material line, uh, line element and pair of trajectory are equivalent terms because uh, material line is defined as infinitesimal line element and if you consider the distance between the endpoints of this line element, it's the same as to consider evolution of pair of trajectories because as you can readily convince yourselves, these uh, points, uh, the, the image of material line, because the flow is infinitesimal. So we will talk about it a bit uh, later, uh, explicitly how you prove it. However, it's very easy to understand that uh, it must be kind of smooth flow, which uh, means that the distance, uh, the image of this line will be still a few, uh, an infinitesimal line element. So there is no distinction between line elements and pairs of trajectories. <coughs> and this actually we will use in a moment when we speak about polymers. 
So this is very simple result of magnetic field. Uh, however, already here, I want uh, that we uh, consider this result in more detail and ask them ourselves if this is really the quantity which we want to know. So you can actually prove using compressibility that this result implies that also at any point in space up to points with zero total uh, volume, you will have the same limit. So you don't need to take uh, this limit in Lagrangian frame. You could also take it at a fixed point and it will still be the same result which I guess you can readily believe because uh, that incompressibility implies that because all images of points X due to incompressibility feel the same volume in so to say rigid way. So Q of T X uh, are as good labeling of uh, points of space as X itself. And this is the reason why the limits must be the same because we have that this limit holds for each trajectory up to these trajectories with uh, zero special volume of initial points. However, the quantity which we are interested mostly in this kind of context is quite different. It's usually the magnetic energy. And the reason is that you want often to know the uh, magnitude of impact of magnetic field on the flow which uh, advects it. So, you consider this uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, and you find there that besides the usual terms, you have another term which you can write in this way using so-called magnetic pressure, which I don't want to talk about at the moment. It's simple, however, uh, I don't want to discuss it. Uh, so, magnetic field reacts on uh, on the flow, and as you may guess. The, if there is no external forces, then, uh, and there is no viscosity, there would be no dissipation and the total energy, which is sum of kinetic energy of the flow and magnetic energy would be zero. Okay, so the interaction, whatever it is, must con conserve the total energy and therefore you can decide how relevant magnetic field is in the Navier-Stokes equations by considering the energy of magnetic field, which is integral of B square dx. Okay. So this is the quantity which we want uh, to find. It's more interesting than actually the limit of uh, magnetic field at each point. However, you could tell that while there is no difference between these quantities, uh, if we know this deterministic law, of course, we can also know this because if this is true at any point in space, then we can write that at large times, this is exponential of twice lambda one T B square X at point zero DX. So it means that energy of magnetic field simply grows as exponential of twice Lyapunov of exponent times time times initial uh, energy, where I use the letter E for the magnetic field energy. So it looks like something very simple, something quite immediate, and it is in fact wrong uh, by orders of magnitude if you consider large times. So how can this be wrong? We will talk about it in a moment. Before we do so, I give you another physical example, which we will consider, which is polymer molecules. Uh, so unless you have any questions on that, let us. So polymer molecules, in fact, uh, are more or less uh, can be considered here. They are very similar to material lines of the fluid. Uh, however, they have they're kind of elastic magnetic lines of the fluid. So what are polymers? For our viewpoint, it's something which is, uh, so let us, polymers in turbulence. And here you have magnetic field. 
intervals. So these are all things which are studied in many works. And these are good applications. So let me make some uh, demarcation line. Uh, so you can see that these uh, polymers, which are uh, in some sense, you can, okay, very roughly, this is, uh, you can think of it as a chain of monomers. So you have uh, some kind of rigid, uh, uh, well, piece of material. It is more or less loosely connected with next piece of the same size. And that is again, loosely speaking, uh, loosely connected to the next uh, monomer of the same size and so forth. And therefore, as you can see, because there are different uh, monomers are uh, not connected rigidly, then you find that uh, location, that direction of the next monomer is actually kind of random in space if you consider thermal equilibrium. So let us start from considering fluid at rest. So in fluid at rest, the uh, polymer will actually form a random walk with uh, monomers which are kind of uh, randomly arranged with respect to each other. Now, uh, so you see that effectively you have random walk where the step size is the size of this monomer and uh, its orientation is arbitrary. Now, there are of course uh, ramifications which must be done here that you cannot uh, allow a monomer to cross the uh, the other monomers. So it is not purely random walk, it is so-called self-avoided random walk. And this uh, kind of random walks were studied a lot and there is a lot which is known about them. It's not a trivial problem at all. Uh, however, this is more or less gives you the understanding which is quite realistic of polymer molecules. And if you want, um, to explain this a bit uh, more realistic. And of course, we don't have this kind of pure monomers which are connected. We have some kind of uh, curve uh, so that orientations have simply finite correlation lengths. So if you start here, the orientation of the, uh, of the next element, so to say, has only finite correlation lengths. And then after this correlation lengths, the orientation becomes random. And we simply, in this way, we make, instead of something which is continuous, where you have kind of gradual transition from here to here, we make a model where you actually make it as piecewise constant, okay? However, uh, qualitatively, certainly it's a good model. Uh, and then we want to know what happens when you put this uh, type of molecules inside the turbulent flow. Now, the reason why we want this is that it was found uh, by Tom in 1947 that uh, actually you can uh, get large effect on turbulent flow by inserting polymers inside it in quite small amounts. So he took something like one part per million by weight and he found that uh, the uh, flow in the, in the pipe actually he needed to apply significantly less pressure in order to drive the flow through the pipe at the same velocity. So uh, typically, if you want to drive any fluid in the pipe, you want to exert some kind of pressure excess so that pressure here is larger than pressure at another end by some delta P. And this pushes the fluid uh, through this uh, pipe. And what was found is that delta P drops in the presence of uh, polymers. Now I need to raise the board and I cannot do it uh, one moment. I'll do it with, uh, by the way, where are we with time? Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, I want to raise from the board here. Okay. I think it's seeable. I do well, okay. one moment. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Let us do it in this way. I want to spend time with this. Okay, so uh, what was found is that uh, delta P drops when minute 
amounts of polymers are injected into turbulent pipe flow. Okay, so this was the discovery which was made long time ago. And of course, this discovery uh, raised much interest because if so, then we could uh, save really a lot of uh, expenditures uh, in pushing fluids uh, through pipelines. And uh, an example which you usually hear is an example of oil pipelines where actually the price of pushing the oil through the pipe is a sub finite fraction of percent of uh, price of oil itself, only to give you an idea. So uh, then if this is true, you want to, to inject some polymers inside oil, which would not change its uh, relevant properties very much. And using these uh, polymers to push it through pipelines and uh, uh, well, it would be a very good technology. Now, in fact, it is used uh, and uh, it's used in Alaska oil pipeline and maybe in others. I think, in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, well, I don't want to give some mistaken data. Uh, so I think it uh, also was used in other pipelines uh, uh, or it was used at least for some time. And you also want to use it, say, if uh, there's some submarine which wants to accelerate, they want to eject these polymers around it and then uh, decrease the resistance of the uh, which it must overcome. And if you want to speed up quickly, that's uh, how you could do it. Uh, so the problem with this approach was that actually polymers have the property that they degrade quickly in the flow. Uh, degrade, degradation in this case means that this elastic uh, uh, material lines, so let me depict it in this way, uh, they actually get torn by the flow. Okay, so the flow simply tears them into pieces and then they become ineffective. So to overcome this problem uh, in Alaska oil pipeline, they use kind of stations which are located every several kilometers, if I'm not mistaken. And they simply uh, reintroduce at, uh, at this station, they reintroduce polymers and continue in this way to have a finite uh, effect. Otherwise, uh, they would simply degrade. There would be no effect after some uh, distance. So uh, then it's, it looks like something uh, 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 which people would study. And of course, people studied this very much, and there were quite a lot of also uh, military studies and other studies of this problem. It is remained unsolved until today, though there are uh, this some understanding which is reached on the transition, the actual description of why this delta P drops and any calculations of that are actually absent. There are some hand waving arguments, but uh, we, we don't have any good theory for this delta P. Moreover, as we measure uh, this delta P, the drop of delta P in different experiments, you find that it varies from experiment to experiment. So what we did manage to understand is mainly how the transition occurs. And the transition is uh, related, uh, well, it's called coil stretch transition. So what it is. So if you have a flow, so the fluid is no longer at rest, then by this property of which we talked about, if you look at this molecule, you realize that it's different uh, parts are under the action of this straining flow. And this molecule is typically has size R, which is much smaller than eta. Now, it, Sometimes it's very close, in fact, to eta. So you must not always take it uh, as self-evident, but usually you can use this assumption. And then uh, you realize that, say, opposite ends of this, if you can somehow loosely define them, of this molecule are going to be stretched by the flow, 
with exponent lambda one. This is what we learned. At the same time, there will be elastic force with characteristic time scale, which is tau. So which of them is going to dominate, whether the molecule is going to be stretched or coiled, is decided by the, uh, by the magnitude of lambda one with respect to this tau. And you can actually understand what it must be in order to produce stretching by a simple argument, which I will show you, and then we will take a break. So you describe, you tell this in this way. So if the molecule is stretched, then it reaches the state where you can unambiguously characterize the molecule with the help of end-to-end -end vector, which we will designate by R. Okay, so this is end-to-end -end vector R. Now this vector, of course, is defined up to the minus sign because if you have R or minus R, it's physically the same molecule. So then you want to write an equation for it. And in this case, it becomes quite simple because the impact of the flow is describable simply with the same law, this matrix sigma times R. Now this time sigma must be evaluated at the position of the molecule and it doesn't really matter if you take center of mass or any, uh, the lowest order it's the same. You can take any point inside the molecule. Uh, so how do you get this equation? For material lines, it's obvious. Now, in the case of water molecule, you need to think that there is some kind of uh, Stokes force, which makes uh, these uh, ends actually glue to the flow. And this is the reason why uh, the you have here the term, which is the same as for material lines. Now, if you want to get some more insight into this, you simply consider the simplest model of polymer molecule, which is known as dumbbell model. And uh, it's very simple. You take it as two balls connected by elastic spring, and then each ball is acted upon by Stokes force, or if you can neglect kind of dynamic interaction between the balls, if you need, you include it. And that means that each ball starts to move at the local velocity of the flow. So uh, this is V of, uh, this ball moves with local velocity V of X, this with V of X plus R. And what this means is that they actually glue to the flow and behave uh, as material line elements. And what is behind it is this friction force, which causes these balls to actually uh, uh, be carried by the flow without any uh, kind of uh, delay uh, immediately. Uh, then there is another term which describes elasticity, which is, in fact, simple elastic force. So this is Hooke uh, law. And it is true because uh, of this property that uh, uh, the force is quadratic, as you can uh, get quite easily from this random walk model. So uh, for polymers, this elastic force is not actually a force, it's so-called entropic force, because it arises not due to actual interaction of monomers, it arises simply because uh, for molecule, there is much more ways to arrange itself into a coil than to arrange itself into some stretch structure, okay? So you simply compare entropies of this type of arrangement where you have some coil. So you have uh, some finite number of monomers, say n monomers, and you need to arrange them either in a coil, which means that you need to get some R, which is typical R, which you have in equilibrium. And of course, there are many ways to do this. And you compare it with the situation where R must be large, and then, of course, there are not much less ways uh, to arrange these monomers. And you compare the entropies, and you find that uh, there is, uh, by using thermodynamic formalism, that there is a force which actually comes from free energy, which is composed. So I remind you that free energy is composed after, uh, from uh, energy and entropy. So energy is irrelevant, but entropy is relevant. And 
you consider the derivative of free energy and you find this elastic force, which uh, I spent time on speaking of this because it's a famous example in physics where you have something which looks as a force, but is not a proper force because it comes from simply a number of ways of arranging something and not actual interactions. So this is the equation which you can uh, hope to work for a molecule when it is uh, uh, its size is much larger than the coil size. This is the reason why you can you can easily to show that this condition guarantees that you can uh, use quadratic uh, dependence of entropy on R, which eventually results in linear force. And you also need to be much smaller than the full length of the molecule. Let's designate it by L, because otherwise you also, uh, well, you start to have interactions relevant because you can no longer simply arrange monomers without uh, any correlations. You already, if it's really stretched, then monomers already interact and any uh, kind of force or attempt uh, to move some very stretched molecule results in large intermolecular forces. So then the energy component and free energy becomes relevant and you start having nonlinear elasticity. So for sizes of polymer molecule, build, uh, well, of course I did it the other way around. So uh, for sizes of polymer molecule, which are much larger than coil size, so entropy is quadratic, and much smaller than L, so energy of interactions of monomers are negligible, you can use this equation. And then the remaining thing is very simple. You introduce R, which is magnitude and orientation. And you repeat the same considerations which we did when we started the lap of exponent. And you find that d dt of logarithm of R equals uh, well, I have equals n sigma n minus one over tau, where n is the same thing which we considered before. So it is uh, dn dt equals sigma n minus n n sigma n. And the reason why this equation is not changed is because this force actually is always radial. So it does not change uh, in any way the orientation of the pair. And what that means is that uh, the average of this n sigma n, if you average this equation over say initial position of polymer, then it is the same lambda one, which we saw previously, uh, which I think you cannot See, yes. So it's the same lambda one. So you find that on average, time derivative of logarithm of R in the case where molecule is stretched is given by lambda one minus one over tau. So the criteria for coil stretch transition becomes very simple. So coil stretch transition is that. Uh, happens that if lambda one is smaller than one over tau, polymer is coiled. If lambda one is larger than one over tau, polymer is stretched. So it's not a complete argument, but it makes it very reasonable. You could, in principle, envisage a situation where this is positive and yet the molecule wants to coil because uh, some, but uh, more or less it's uh, uh, clear that it must be this. And in fact, uh, this is proved by a bit more rigorous analysis, which I'll do after the break. So if you don't have any questions, we take a break for 15 minutes and then we continue. Okay, so before we go for a break, there is a question from Pavel Bilov. Uh, I would prefer that you simply speak, but uh, it's up to you, of course. So the question is, where does the uh, uh, term B grad V in the upper equation come from? 
Oh, okay. So uh, this, all the terms actually come from uh, Maxwell equations here. So uh, in order to get it, you need to consider, uh, so I will not give you detailed explanation because derivation of MHD as you usually call magnetohydrodynamics is not my purpose here. Uh, it can be found, in, say, in volume eight of London Lipschitz. Uh, however, you start with Maxwell equations. So you have that DTB is curl of E. I will not care about the signs. And then you use that E is something like uh, uh, J plus, uh, well, mm, what you need to get it. Uh, Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, in any case, you need to use that curl of B is J. And then probably you take another. So somehow you get it from here when you use that J is sigma times E, where sigma is conductivity. And you do some quite well, not completely straightforward, but not uh, very difficult manipulations with the uh, Maxwell equations in the presence of flow, and you derive these equations. Uh, yes, it comes from Maxwell equations. Any other questions? Okay, so we take a break and reconvene in 15 minutes. All right. Uh, so uh, I'll send the reference, uh, I'll send simply the paper uh, regarding viscous subrange about which I was requested in the chat. Uh, so you see that from these two problems that uh, Labanov exponent gives you much insight. Uh, however, you need somewhat more. So in the question with magnetic field, you cannot discover immediately that you need something more because uh, you would think that, well, this is probably true. Uh, however, if you would be cautious, then you could see that there can be a problem. And, uh, well, maybe, let me see. So uh, you are given this limit, okay? Uh, I am telling you that this equality is wrong. Uh, could you please, uh, some of you, uh, tell me what can be wrong? And I am only asking those who don't know the answer already. So you can either write in the chat or simply speak. Okay, I'll wait. It's uh, so. Uh, is uh, let me. Uh, uh, I need some indication that you understood what I am asking about. So, can any of you? Uh, all right. So, you are given that for any fixed x, as you take time going to infinity, you consider magnetic field in a turbulent flow, which is a random flow. And uh, from our understanding, we found that this logarithm is actually tending to a limit, which is lambda one. So uh, the, what I would like you to tell me what, uh, so, it would then seem from this, because this is a deterministic limit, which holds for every x up to x with zero total volume. And therefore, it implies this equation. So what can be then, what could go wrong about writing this equality, at least asymptotically? Okay, let us go step by step. Who understood the question? This time I would like it to write in the chat, please.
Okay, good. So Imanol understood, Pavel understood, uh, Fabian did not, Maurizio understood. Okay. All right. So, and Pupish did not understand. Okay, that's good. Uh, we start to have some interaction and we need it because uh, otherwise this course will pass with no trace and that's not something which any of us wants, I think. Uh, so, uh, did you understand this equality that this is direct consequence of uh, definition of the level of exponent? Okay. Uh, Bopish, did you? Okay, so then uh, consider magnetic energy. So magnetic energy is defined, uh, well, in principle, you need to put here one over two, B square, T, X, D. Now, uh, I can either rely on what I told you that this implies this, but I did not fully rigorously prove it. So instead, I can rewrite the magnetic energy, so it's integral over total domain of the flow. So we can switch the integration variables, and we can then, so integral is over x, and instead of x, I will use q of tx. And I will immediately rename the dummy variable, so I can write that this is equal because Jacobian is one, so we have incompressible flow. So this Jacobian must be one. This is incompressibility, volumes are conserved. Then I can rewrite the magnetic energy in this way. Okay. Is this okay? Uh, okay, thanks. All right, then I can use this equality and I could write that this, at least asymptotically, because you could have, say, here in logarithm, say, terms which are, say, square, this could have some term which is, uh, say, square root of time which after division by t would be zero. So I only can write that there is asymptotic equality, exponent twice lambda one t, v square t equals zero x dx. Okay. Which is nothing but exponent of twice lambda one t, I will erase the condition of Jacobian. So we can see the incompressible term and flow, so it's okay, times initial energy. Okay. So the question which, uh, so the, uh, what I wanted you to think about is that this is true, and yet I'm telling you that this is not true. So what can be wrong? I mean, you're not considering maybe nonlinearity in the equation. Maybe the Abunov analysis applies only for short time. Well, Lapunov exponent is a property which is in fact uh, it depends. If you speak of payoff trajectories, it's true. However, here we speak of magnetic field, which is always uh, kind of infinitesimal timeline, uh, infinitesimal line element. So this is not a problem at all, and this is in fact true. So we'll speak about it a bit later, but uh, in a different language, but there's no problem of that sort. Thank you. 
Pavel tells that uh, uh, he thinks that everything is correct if there is a pumping. Okay, uh, yes, you need to have pumping in the flow. Uh, the turb we assume the turbulence is stationary, uh, which uh, still does not uh, show us the problem with. This. So this is still wrong. Okay. Um, please uh, think kind of uh, freely. There's no problem if you get mistaken or something of that sort. Not to think is worse than to think wrongly, I think. Uh, anybody? Okay, let us then uh, think together. So you are given that for each initial position, up to positions which are not relevant in space integrals, this limit is true, okay? And up to here, everything is okay. So what does this limit tells you, uh, tell you and what it does not? Uh, okay, uh, Bopesh, uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, if not, please correct me because it might be Bopesh, uh, I need to know. Uh, so please correct me if I need to pronounce H or not. So uh, Bupish pro uh, proposes that maybe there is singularity at in space coordinate. Uh, no, there's no uh, singularity, which you probably refer to some points where this is wrong, but these points are really negligible in this interval. It's true. Uh, so, uh, did you, uh, it's something which you studied in your undergraduate courses. It's not something which you would not be able to answer, of course. Uh, I still would need to hear some more of you. Uh, I realize that you might feel a bit uncomfortable. Please do not. It's not, uh, uh, it's not an exam. It's not, uh, there's nothing wrong about being wrong. Uh, so uh, any ideas? Uh, well, I still give you some more time. And the reason is that uh, when you think of such kind of questions, you learn most effectively. Uh, uh, I can do a nasty thing and ask people who I know. <laughs> I will not do it, of course. OK. All right, those of students, not of professors who are here, who know the answer, can you, if there are some, can you tell us? Okay, so apparently there are no students who know the answer to this. Okay, so what can go wrong? Uh, in order to understand what can go wrong, you need to carefully consider your assumptions. So the fact that you have this limit tells you that at large enough times, you can tell that B of T, Q of T, X is asymptotically exponential of twice lambda one T times B, well, let's take the square here, uh, t equals zero x. So this is okay. It's true. This limit means this. Uh, however, it tells you that this is true at large enough times. And these times may depend on x. There is no guarantee that for different axes in space, the histories of uh, velocity gradients, which are responsible for stretchings via this magic sigma, uh, would produce this limit at the same time. So this is true for t, which is much greater than some t star. Well, let me write it as symbolic equality so that uh, it's not a bit pathological, uh, which depends on x. 
So nobody told you that this limit is uniform in X. And in fact, it's not uniform and quite strongly non uniform. So it is true only that the volume uh, fraction of points for which this is not true decreases exponentially in time. Uh, so we are talking about very rare events. So when you think about it, it's really a very good case to learn what are rare events and how they can be relevant. So uh, volume fraction of points for which equation star is wrong decreases in time exponentially. This we did not derive yet, it can be shown. So it will be shown later. Okay. However, what it might happen is that for those uh, points for which it's uh, wrong, uh, you could have a situation where despite that the volume is exponentially small, it still gives the dominant contribution into this integral. Now, how this can happen? This can happen because you might have some volume. So let's, uh, which, so let's designate it, uh, this decay by gamma t. Okay, so the volume decreases exponentially. In the limit of infinite time, the volume of points for which this is wrong becomes zero. This is what ergodic theorem tells us. However large time is, this volume is vanishingly small. It's, say, you take time, so exponential decay is very fast decay. You take time, which is say, I don't know, 1000 in the units of one over gamma. And this is e to power minus 1000, which is extremely small fraction of volume. And this is something to reckon about because, uh, to think about because it actually tells you that we are going to talk of some things which are really very difficult to detect at large times. So this is very serious, uh, observational problem of things which we will talk about. So what, why this volume can still be relevant? Because it could be, and it, in fact it is, that for this volume, b square of t q t x will actually behave as exponent of some gamma t. In fact, let me already here write this gamma of 2t. Well, okay, it would be a bit too much to introduce notation here. So exponent of gamma t. So the contribution to this integral, if this is so, it's not completely so, but it's close to the truth. So then you would be able to tell that this integral of t q t x dx has a contribution which is exponent of twice lambda one t. Let me divide here by the volume, not to carry the factor of volume. So it is of order of exponential of twice lambda one t from volume fraction, which is close to one. On that volume fraction, if you take as large time as you please, you have uh, B, which is given by this formula. However, there is another contribution which comes from volume which is exponentially small. However, the measured quantity there is exponentially large. So it means that in these regions, magnetic field is, uh, well, line elements are stretched much stronger than usual. So the rate is not lambda one, but it's, uh, uh, in this case, it's gamma over two, okay? So that's the rate of stretch. So if, uh, let me see if you have it on the board. So if 
gamma small minus uh, is larger than gamma plus twice lambda one, then this term dominates. Okay, now this is incredible because uh, this is our first instance of situation where things which are concentrated in volumes of space, which you probably would not even be able to detect. So if you think of, uh, say, uh, measurements in astrophysics, if you measure this thing at large times, you would simply need very high resolution. Uh, and for any, uh, in the limit of infinite times, you will always be mistaken about measurements of magnetic energy because sooner or later this volume will become undetectable and yet it will it is the volume which will contain the whole energy okay so this is a extreme case of intermittency in some sense it's stronger than uh, it's not stronger than intermittency that we spoke about but it is uh, definitely a very striking example and we will elaborate on it a bit uh, well not a bit we we'll elaborate on it more in a moment so uh, are there any questions? Did you understand what goes wrong here? Uh, Fabian and uh, Vopish, or Hupish, please tell me how I pronounce it. Uh, was it understandable, this explanation? Thanks. OK. All right, so uh, let us uh, see how these things work because uh, they're really something to think about and keep in mind when you work in terminals. So uh, you see that you need to understand more details on the growth of the magnetic field in this case, in the sense that you need to know uh, what is the growth rate in regions of space, which are in fact exponentially small in time. Uh, so here, it's, uh, this need comes from a uh, desire to understand very fundamental property, which is magnetic energy. So it's the main characteristics of magnetic field configuration. Uh, in this case, in the case of polymers, it could look that lambda one is okay, However, again, if you think of it, what we proved and what we did not, you realize that also here you would need a bit more knowledge of what's going on because uh, lambda one only tells you that, well, on average, when polymers are in this range, so they are kind of stretched, but not stretched to the full length. Well, they are on average seemingly they are stretched, but maybe there will be something which, uh, well, maybe so what could go wrong um, so they are stretched for some time and then they are somehow returned from large length mm, well it's still ah okay so it's still only in the quality on average rate of change of logarithm of distance and you you cannot know from this if this is really uh, well you can turn it into a proof but still it's kind of obvious that you need to do some more work than we did. Uh, so the proof which you can construct would be by contradiction, but uh, let us not uh, uh, go into that because that's not necessary at this point. We are going to get in any case more knowledge on the growth rates. Uh, all right, so to describe these situations, we need the quantity which is known as generalized Lapinov exponent. And as we will see, in fact, generalized Lapinov exponent can be understood as Lapinov exponent in functional space. Uh, so this you can read in one of the papers on Reynolds number dependence of Lapinov exponents, which I sent you. Uh, so uh, let us, uh, so this is already a property, which if you go and study numerically, you can do a paper, which uh, I think would it's be published. Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, before you delete that, it's in my note here. So yes, on the last I can recognize equation, your voice. <laughs> on the okay. last equation, on the last line, so I see exponential of the lambda one, which is, I assume, a constant. 
and then you have plus the exponential of gamma. But gamma is space dependent, or is it a constant as well? Uh, well, here I did a model which is so to say by model. So I told you that there is uh, most of the space where the growth rate of magnetic field is lambda one, yeah. and there is the rest of the space which is exponentially small in time where the growth rate is uh, gamma small over two. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is uh, what I assumed. This is not completely true because in okay. reality you have a whole spectrum of growth rates of gamma and for each value in this spectrum you have a corresponding exponentially decaying volume okay I see. okay so we'll okay. talk about it thanks uh any other questions ah okay uh so to pavel below it was not very clear pavel can you please tell us what was not very clear where it was not understandable. Uh, hello? Yes. Yeah, so uh, actually in your equation, there was um, uh, exp exponent which should go to infinity. So uh, this means that uh, we, should, uh, we, we should have uh, some um, decreasing of uh, uh, magnetic field so th and uh, pro probably if we have some pumping then we have uh, energy supply and uh, this uh, uh, there should not be the volume uh, which should decrease uh, exponentially if we have a, a, a pumping in my opinion or okay. is it not correct so, well, so my, my point is that uh, if we have uh, supply of energy, then we do not have uh, the volume which exponentially decreasing. Uh, right. is, it, is it correct or not? Uh, well, th there's no correct. You, you can think something at this point, and uh, because you are studying, you would simply need to see what uh, uh, kind of to direct your thought. So you are thinking about pumping. So uh, what kind of pumping you are talking about? Pumping for uh, velocity field for flow of turbulence, or pumping for magnetic field? Um, uh, <laughs> I actually don't know. Some some supply of energy in to the system. Okay. So, so uh, I don't know how it's realized. So uh, we, so uh, if if we have supply of energy, then we can overcome this exponential decrease of uh, this uh, volume. Uh, I think. Okay. Uh, so we are considering all the time in this course turbulence which is stationary. So there is a source of energy which drives the fluid turbulence, and. Uh, Therefore, there's no problem with pumping. So what decreases exponentially is volume of space points where this equality, this asymptotic equality is wrong. So we know that in the limit for each fixed X, there is a time starting from which this asymptotic equality is true. So what I'm telling is that there's no kind of physical property which decays exponentially. I think from what you are telling, it seems that you think that there is some physical quantity which decreases exponentially. There is no physical quantity which decreases exponentially here. What decreases exponentially is the mathematical volume of points for which this is wrong at large times t. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, I do appreciate you asking. Please uh, ask more. I, is it? Can I assume that everybody completely understood it? Okay. All right. Let's assume this. Uh, so I'll continue erasing from the board.
we will uh, get into more details on this. So if still you did not understand completely and for various reasons don't come to us, uh, usually not to embarrass yourself, uh, please ask because there's nothing, no embarrassment in asking questions and in, being, in asking stupid questions when you study. The embarrassment comes when you think that you know something. Yes, please. Sorry, Professor. Could could you repeat the the conclusion that uh, you you have just told about the um, mathematical volume that is uh, just just the last thing you yes. you, you told us. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Francesca. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you for asking. It's kind of. Uh, relief for me because I do think that you must ask questions at this point so please do so so and thank you for showing your face <laughs> all right so um, this is the uh, the statement so you have you do know that for each fixed x in space you take uh, so you take initial some initial x you have a trajectory so say this is time and this is x and we take to show things we take one dimensional space so this is the trajectory so if this is time t this is according to our definition this is q of tx and i don't write vectors because we take this 1d model so I will also so uh, you measure at this point in space uh, the magnetic field at time t and we are guaranteed that if we take time t large enough it will be true that this is this uh, in the asymptotic equality holds now asymptotic equality of course means that you might have some corrections but they would simply uh, be uh, negligible at large enough times so this is true for times which are larger than t star, which depends on x. So say you have, let's take this 2D model. So you have points for which you can tell that at time t, this distance is exponential of, so if this is distance between trajectories, this is exponential of lambda 1t. And this is also exponential of lambda 1t. Of course, to read in order, the distances must not be literally equal. It's only to read in order that they must be equal. And you have another pair, which is also has the distance exponent of lambda 1t between trajectories. And many of this sort, and they in fact become, in the limit of infinite time, they become space filling. That is, at any point, trajectories will be separated at uh, exponent lambda 1. However, there are sp some special regions. So time is large, but it is finite. So there is some finite region, might be very complex region. Its geometry is typically, uh, I would think that in the limit of, so in the limit of infinite time, this region in fact approaches a fractal. Uh, we will not discuss the geometry of this region. It's not relevant for what we're talking about now, but there is some region. Uh, which uh, in our model of uh, what happens, the volume of this region, so let's designate this volume by V and total volume by omega. In this case, these are areas, but uh, I'm using the language of 3D space of which we are speaking. So volume of this region divided by omega behaves as exponential of minus gamma T. So in this sense, it's exponentially small volume. And trajectories which go outside of these points, pairs of trajectories are anomalous in the sense that they separate much stronger. So here, the separation law is exponent of gamma t with some gamma, which is larger than lambda one, okay? So when I speak of mathematical volume of points where this equality is wrong, I refer to the volume of, uh, to this volume of red points where uh, trajectories would uh, stretch according to a different law. Okay, okay, thanks.
thank you very much. Now it's thank more you. more clear. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for telling me that uh, if you need to leave, because when people are leaving, I'm always there's no. Uh, I, I, I will actually, uh, in this case, me cannot know why, and because I want that you understand things and uh, enjoy the course. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a bit more. Yes. May I ask uh, another similar question? Uh, why, why, why don't we have uh, this distance, which is uh, exponent in the lambda t for t uh, going to infinity, to be going to infinity too? And the distance between trajectories uh, for the infinite time, uh, it should be uh, increasing to infinity. Is it correct? Yes. Or not? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yes, we are talking about unbounded growth of magnetic field energy in this case, or unbounded growth of distance between trajectories. Of course, when we speak of distance between trajectories, it's somewhat, uh, again, it's mathematical uh, thing which we're talking about, it's idealization. So what we have in mind is that at any finite time, if you take really very small initial distance, you will be able to describe it with this exponential. So it's really something which describes growth of infinitesimal line elements, okay? So there's nothing, uh, actual distance between pairs of trajectories does not become infinite, okay? Understood? Okay, good. So the observation of course is that you will see that magnetic field increases exponentially really. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, this picture I would want to keep somehow, but uh, uh, well, let's see if I can arrange the volume of the board so that I can keep this thing. Okay, so let us uh, look closer and study this property which is called uh, generalized lab of exponent. And in one of the papers of uh, Manivore and uh, Johnson, this is one of the main objects which they studied uh, using numerical simulations. All right, uh, generalized lab of exponent. Now it's a bit confusing name. So I wrote exponents because in fact, it's not one quantity, it's a whole function. Uh, this function depends on the real number k. And it is defined in this way as limit as time goes to infinity, logarithm of average rk of t divided by rk of zero divided by time. Okay, so let us look at this definition and uh, get some understanding of it. So for starters, this definition tells you that RK, let me introduce here also symbol S, which is for spatial average. And it is not a trivial thing to do as we will talk about in the moment. So for starters, we speak about average uh, of powers of R of K, which are uh, average in space. Now, what do we mean here? So again, it's good to discuss this. So we found that for uh, infinitesimal line elements. So how you avoid discussing the actual distance between uh, pairs of particles, uh, you do this by assuming that you can apply the law, which is R of t equals R at zero, exponent of integral from zero to t, m sigma n dt prime, okay? So this is how we actually wrote this equation. Uh, so we had, I remind that we derived that time derivative of logarithm of the distance, as long as you can assume that the distance is infinitesimal and infinitesimal distance means uh, that you can 
uh, assume that you can use uh, Taylor expansion of velocity field in order to determine the structure of line element. So we found that this is this quantity. So when you integrate this equation, this is what you get. Okay. So it's straightforward integration of the equation. And uh, this is the sense in which we speak here of distance between pairs of trajectories. We assume that for all times in which we are interested, they remain much smaller than the viscous scale. Now, uh, it's uh, physically reasonable because, for instance, for magnetic field, this is what you have because uh, magnetic field, its direction at each point defines infinitesimal line elements, which is directed along this direction of B. So the definition then is that I remind to you that as we talked about uh, today, uh, this is a function of X. So it's function of T prime, but it is also a function of X through the, which is the initial position of the trajectory. So then you can actually speak of uh, average in space of this quantity. So this is RK of T and X. So it depends on, so it depends on initial position of pair of trajectories. And as we talked about, it does not depend on the initial value of this orientation vector N because it gets forgotten in a finite time. So we will not write that dependence. So you can then average of the initial position, which again is a very uh, simple physical procedure. You throw a random pair of particles, you watch uh, how it separates, you calculate at time t kth power of the distance, and then you repeat this argument to throw at random another pair of particles separated infinitesimally. You again uh, propagate it for time t and so forth. And so no later, the average over these pairs will be close to the space average. Okay. So this is our definition, and S stands for space. All right. So uh, it's okay that you define it. However, it's not guaranteed that it's a good definition in the sense that uh, it might, as it stands, depend on realization of turbulent flow. In this sense that you solve Navier-Stokes equations, you, for given velocity field, you can certainly produce this function in the, using the procedure of which I talk, which I described. And then uh, you do another simulation of Navier-Stokes equations and you are not guaranteed that this is going to be the same answer. And in fact, this quantity as it stand will be different. It will depend on realization of velocity field. So one of the things about Lyapunov exponent itself, this lambda one is that it's not uh, dependent on realization of velocity field. So it involves infinite time limit. And I stress that it does not depend on where you put pay of trajectories and when. It also is independent of realization of the flow, which means that if you use the same type of forcing, which can be by itself random or non-random, but if it's random, it has the same statistics. So you use the, the velocity field with the same statistics, you're going to get the same lambda one for each realization, okay? This is, again, not a trivial state. So here, uh, when you look at this quantity, you might have and you will have this quantity dependent on realization. And yet this quantity in the same way as lambda one, as we will see, does not depend on realization of the flow, which means that you do another simulation of Navier-Stokes equations with the same force, you will get the same gamma of K, provided that you force turbulence in the same way. Okay, so the definition of this quantity involves this. So it is RK of zero, average of exponential of K integral from zero to T and sigma N DT prime uh, Let me keep this uh, dependence on x. So I will from time to time write first the space argument and then time or the other way around. 
please do not get confused about it. The reason is very simple. In papers, I usually write time as first argument and x as second argument. And the reason is that I think about x as index uh, of Lagrangian variables, okay? Uh, so it comes, of course, from certain physical understanding. Uh, however, it's more usual to write first a spatial argument and then time. It's completely up to you. Simply don't get confused about it. Uh, I think it's quite evident all the time what we are doing. All right, so this is our definition. All right, so as it stands, it does not look approachable, okay? So you have unknown gradients of turbulent flow. You have unknown orientation of pair M. You exponentiate it, you integrate it over time, you multiply it with K, and then you integrate over space. So it does not look like a quantity which you would be able to tell something about. Uh, then after the first impression passes, you look at it closer and then you start thinking, well, um, in some sense, it does not look approachable. However, I realize that if time is t is large, because of randomness, this process actually has finite correlation time. And at large times, this quantity will be, as we discussed with you, uh, sum of large number of independent random variables. OK, so this is already something, so let us make an effort and use this information in the way which you would do uh, after the studies of uh, first degree or like maybe master degree. Well, usually bachelor degrees, uh, you already studied these things. So you realize that this is average of some uh, quantity X, let us designate it by X capital, <coughs> which is integral from zero to T and sigma m t prime dt prime. So in what sense it is random? Every word in the language of scientific paper, you need to understand uh, sooner or later. So when you start your studies, you may skip a word or two which you don't understand in order to get to the things which you want uh, actually to study. But at certain point, you need to understand every word. So in which sense we are telling that this is random? In the very concrete sense that uh, it depends on initial position, okay? So it's uh, randomness is uh, defined uh, with respect to the average over initial position of the pair. So you consider this as random variable simply in the sense of speaking of properties of different space averages, okay? No more, no less. This is our definition. Then you look at it, you consider that it is because of finite correlation time, I remind you, we wrote it as sum of the mutually exclusive time intervals of length, which is the correlation time of this process. And then we found that actually this becomes sum of large number of independent random variables. Okay, that is good. So assume that you understood this. Then you look at this and you realize that this is average. So what it is that you, you, you would use from your undergraduate studies in order to perform this average? In other words, what would you think the statistics of X must be? And then what would you, would you think the average would be? So uh, again, this is something which I would uh, request that you tell me what you think. Okay, for starters, is it understandable what I'm asking about? Okay. So what do you think the statistics of X is at large times? And this is a question to those who did not study large deviations theory.
Okay, thanks, Pavel. All right, so this is the answer which uh, after undergraduate studies, most of you uh, would think about that this must be a Gaussian random variable because what you learned is central limit theorem, which tells you that sum of large number of identical, uh, independent identically distributed random variables, which in this case are integrals over this uh, stretching rate over time, which is correlation time. Uh, statistics is Gaussian. Who does not know central limit theorem here? Okay, so uh, why then it was only Pavel who responded? You, well, I assume that you didn't have time to think about it. Okay, so if this is uh, Gaussian, then you know very well the law of average and of exponential of Gaussian variables. If you don't, please uh, look, uh, I think even in Wikipedia you can find this or well, preferably use probability theory book, which I would recommend uh, Fenner's book. I think it's uh, uh, definitely the most, uh, well, the book to recommend on probability. So you would find that average of any Gaussian X can be written in this way. It's sum exponential of sum of K times average X plus K square over two times dispersion, where dispersion is x squared minus x average squared. And we close the brackets. So this is the law of averaging of this quantity. Okay, so let us uh, go ahead with this uh, hypothesis of ours and see what we are going to get. So if this is true, then we're going to get from this that uh, this is equal. Uh, so we continue from here up to here. Okay, so this is RK of zero exponent. So let us look at this point closer at the average. So what is the average of this process? And here, I will not move from this point until some of you gives me the answer or you all tell me that you cannot. So what is the average of n sigma n? Okay. All right, so if you calculate, please recall our definition of the first Lapinov exponent of lambda one. Does it, uh, so we gave it several forms. One of them involved averaging over space. So what is average of this n sigma n? Uh, okay, who does not mind me uh, asking uh, directly this person? Okay, you see, uh, I'm asking this uh, not only that uh, we kind of we interact and I learn where you are. It's also because if you don't know what is the average of n sigma n then it means that uh, I cannot proceed further because it's a more fundamental quantity. Okay, so what is ever, uh, did it, did you see this quantity previous? It's a, yes. I assume you are trying to link it with the first Lyapunov exponent, but I, I, I think that this is only when time is big enough, so the average when time is big enough can be something related to Lyapunov, lambda one? Yes. So this is lambda one, thanks. Uh, let us see why you could not answer this question. It might be that I did not give you uh, enough understanding of this thing. So let us review briefly this. So, um, uh, and this will also explain Imanol's answer. 
So what I showed to you today is that you can write lambda one as limit as time goes to infinity, one over t. So I remind to you, we were speaking about this process as, uh, so we defined lambda one as self averaging quantity. And then we told that it is equal to its own average over space. And this gives us a nice way to find it because you see, you have definition of lambda one, but then you want somehow to calculate it. And to calculate means typically when you deal with the random flow to write it via different statistical properties of that flow, correlation functions or something of that sort. And Nassim, you want to tell something? Uh, okay, so some of you turned on the mic, so I thought that was some question. Okay, so you have uh, this is something which we found together today. Uh, you saw this form, okay? Now, according to our definition, average over space is this angular brackets with S here, okay? So here, after we write it as average, we don't keep the spatial argument because it's averaged over. So it remains as a function of time. Okay. So then uh, previously we talked with you, uh, Nassim, you wrote your name. What is the reason for that? Okay, uh, you probably wrote it to indicate that you are present. We are no longer doing that. There's another way to get that uh, who was present. So, okay. So uh, we have this uh, identity. Then you realize that uh, as we uh, uh, spoke with you uh, the other day, this N relaxes after some time to a process which is no longer dependent on initial condition for n. Sigma from the very beginning is a random stationary process. It is gradients of the flow of turbulence taken in the frame of the fluid particle. So which means that at large times this quantity is average over stationary random process. And by definition, average of a stationary process is time independent. So in fact, at large times, this is constant. And then if you average over infinite time, anything which at large times approaches a constant, then the result of averaging is simply that constant. So the end result is that you can erase the averaging. And this is what Immanuel told us that it's this average taken in the limit of infinite time. So in fact, I can see at this point that I asked you something which you could not really answer, which is good, uh, well, because, uh, uh, so it is okay. And Imanol was able to answer this because he works on these things and he simply knows it. Okay, so uh, at this point, we realize that average of this n sigma n at least at large times is simply lambda one. And because we are planning to consider limit of infinite times, then we can use as average this lambda one and not care about uh, finite time corrections. Now, then it gives you that this average of this X, so this is our definition of X. So we find that at large times, let me write it here. At large times, average of x of t must be approximately equal to lambda 1t because it's simply this average at large times, which is lambda 1. And there are some corrections because this average at small times is something else and we don't really know what. However, at large times, we are guaranteed that this is that. So we can use the formula of Gaussian averaging and we have that this is exponential of k lambda one t. The next thing to find is dispersion. And in fact, this dispersion is often designated by uh, mu. So I will introduce that notation. 
So it's plus k square over two times t times mu. So I will define in a moment what this mu is. Okay, so this is a standard notation, so I keep it. Uh, let us see then what this quantity is. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let me erase this explanation. I hope I will not forget to erase this red color here. Okay, so you have this integral and you want to consider the dispersion. So how do you consider the dispersion? Uh, this is the definition. So you write x square minus x average square it is equal to average from zero to t dt1 dt2 and then you write these things as average of n sigma n t1 and sigma n t2 and again because you plan to take limit of large times you can take it minus lambda one squared and close the brackets. Okay, so the fact that at large times, uh, this, uh, so whenever you have large time difference between the points, uh, you find that uh, this average deco decomposes into product of averages, and then this is uh, becoming at large t1 and t2 equal to lambda 1 square. So this integral is convergent. Then there is something which uh, you need to learn at certain point, which is that whenever uh, it's a calculation which occurs in theory of uh, stationary processes with a finite correlation time over and over. And it is something which you simply need to learn because it's used very much. So this is this identity that if you have, uh, let's see what I can erase here. Uh, okay, so let me erase the definition. Okay, so suppose that you have for any random stationary process, Psi of t, you have that average of integral uh, from zero to t psi of t prime dt prime square minus average integral from zero to t psi of t prime dt prime squared equals at large times t times integral from minus infinity to infinity integral of psi t psi zero minus psi average square dt. And not to get confused with this, I'll put it right here. And so that you can distinguish things on the board, I will erase here. Okay. All right, so this is an identity which is extremely useful. Uh, it is uh, something which tells you that uh, integrals of uh, dispersion of finite correlate of integrals of finite correlated noise at large times behave proportionally to time, and this property is uh, the property from which you actually derive uh, such things as diffusion of Brownian particles and many many other properties. So. Uh, for turbulence, it's relevant when you speak of tail and diffusion. Um, so I'm using the names without explaining them so that when you hear them next time, it rings a bell and then maybe you connect. Uh, so then uh, you have that, uh, how do you prove this identity? Actually, you look at something, uh, so without any uh, loss, you can use Xi, which has zero mean, okay? because you can always achieve a process with zero mean by taking instead of Xi, Xi minus Xi average, okay? So let us assume from the very beginning that Xi has zero average, then we don't have this term. And we also don't need to write this cumbersome 
expressions, we simply have that this is equal to t times integral from minus infinity to infinity, psi of t prime, psi of zero dt prime. And this is also a form which uh, formulas like famous uh, green Kubo formula from non-equilibrium statistical physics states. Uh, so it's something really to have in your mind. Uh, so how you prove it? The proof is actually very simple. So let me write it here. So you take this square, which means that you simply consider average of psi of t1, psi of t2, dt1, dt2 from 0 to t. Then you use that the process is stationary and it is correlated over some finite time, okay? So if you consider integral uh, from minus infinity to infinity, psi of t1, psi of t2, dt2, okay? So you take, you allow here t2 to go to minus infinity, okay? So you consider a different integral when, than you have here. Then the result of this integration is, of course, because of stationarity, is the same as integral psi zero, psi t, dt, from minus infinity to infinity. So this is property of stationarity. Now then you, uh, so trivially it's independent of t1, okay? Then you uh, can, uh, look at it closer and you realize that the integral over t2 actually runs not over, of course, infinite range of t2. It is affected mostly uh, by t2, which are in the vicinity of t1, which is of order of correlation time. This is basically the definition of correlation time. So this is true for all t1s. Uh, so this is, uh, because the integral runs only over times which are in T1, uh, in tau correlation vicinity of T1, then you conclude that also integral from zero to infinity, psi of T1, psi of T2, dT2, it is also equal to this uh, integral, or oh, now it becomes invisible, uh, well, invisible in the sense not visible, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, uh, let's see, uh, okay, I'll continue. So if you consider integral from zero to infinity of psi of T1, psi of T2, dT2. If T1 is much larger than correlation time of this process, then this is the same as integral from minus infinity to infinity of psi of t1, psi of t2, d t2. Okay, so the reason is very simple because effectively this integral from zero to infinity runs uh, for t1, which is much larger than correlation time, times which are uh, negative do not contribute this integral at all. Uh, this integral, but also the integrals are equal and in turn are equal to this. So the only thing which remains is that you look here and you realize that if time t is much larger than correlation time, then you can neglect t1s which are of order of correlation time and only consider t1s which are much larger than correlation time. And then you can use these equalities and you conclude that this integral is simply becomes integral from zero to t dt1 of integral from zero to uh, from minus infinity to infinity psi zero psi t dt average. Okay, so this in the end gives you this identity because integral over t1 over this interval simply gives you length of this interval and this is what you're left. All right, so uh, was it, a, could I write bigger? Okay, uh, Fabian, thank you for uh, requesting this. Can you tell me uh, what was not uh, seeable uh, so that I don't need to rewrite everything? Yes, uh, 
the first equation for any random ah okay so here for any random stationary process with zero average ah no no it's not going to be simple uh Okay, so what is telling here for any random stationary process? Let me tell you in one step, uh, which has zero average and finite correlation term, which we designate by tau correlation. This is going to be true for times which are much larger than correlation time. Okay. Uh, Fabian, is there anything you cannot see at all? Uh, well, I the equation in that part this equation yeah no the second term this yes okay thanks i don't see it okay one moment please uh, so here you have t integral from minus infinity up to infinity psi of t prime psi of zero d t prime okay any other questions all right so then uh, we continue. Uh, so then we use this formula. So dispersion of x is of course the same as dispersion of x minus x average. So when you use this formula, you find that uh, dispersion of x uh, is t times mu, where mu is in this case, uh, let me uh, erase something already. Oh. Mm. Okay, so I can do it here. And here I want to restore that. Okay. Okay. So uh, mu is defined as integral from minus infinity to infinity and sigma n minus lambda uh, of time t minus lambda one times n sigma n at time zero minus lambda one average is taken in a steady state and here you have d t. ah no it's not going to be visible integral from minus infinity to infinity dt. Okay, I'll switch the colors. All right, so this is the definition and people studied this quantity. Uh, it was actually predicted in the same paper by Crisanti and uh, Paladin and uh, who else was involved, which I sent you. Uh, so this is a property which again has dimensions of the same dimensions as lambda one, which is inverse time. And for this quantity, you actually find that intermittency causes uh, its pro So if you make again dimensionless product, you multiply this mu with Kolmogorov time. Then Kolmogorov theory tells you again that uh, it must be some quantity of order one and independent of Reynolds number. In reality, you find that this goes as Reynolds to power delta, where apparently delta is something like 0.3, okay? So this is something which is uh, very, uh, has already strong dependence on Reynolds number. And this is our uh, first instance of really uh, quantity whose uh, Reynolds number dependence you cannot neglect. So, so far we considered Lapidot exponent, 
but there we have power uh, exponent which was 0 0.04 which is okay well it's good to know that it depends on Reynolds number and okay you can see in simulations that it really decreases with Reynolds it's uh, appreciable it's visible but it's not something which uh, you would be kind of uh, think that it would produce some strong consequences. Now, this thing already is something significant. Uh, uh, it can produce quite strong consequences. And I think it does. All right. So, uh, and I'm telling cautiously, I think, because uh, there are no, well, it's not that I think, I'm convinced that it is like that, but there are no simulations yet because we have not reached yet large Reynolds numbers everywhere we want to reach. And because we still did not make any, all the experiments which are needed for Reynolds numbers, which we do reach. So uh, this is the reason uh, for my a bit cautious uh, statement. Uh, however, there is little doubt that uh, some kind of law of this sort holds. All right, so um, then you find this law and well, you can hope that in this way, you actually described the, uh, this average. Now, the truth is that it's typically wrong. Now, and it is wrong for Navier-Stokes equations. So for some model flows, it's true. Uh, what is going wrong? So where did we go wrong? Uh, here comes something which you cannot guess, I think. Maybe you can, but uh, it would be quite difficult. That uh, actually uh, we are averaging exponential of some of large number of independent identically distributed random variables, and averages of exponentials are not describable with central limit theory. And the reason is, in fact, very simple. So, in fact, uh, I'm going to write something. And you will think how come that we could think that this quantity is gauge. So uh, it's simply kind of you need to change the view uh, to see these things. So let me uh, then erase this. And in fact, I will also erase this. All right. So. So we arrived to the conclusion that this is at least qualitatively, you can think about it as sum of large number of independent, identically distributed random variables. And this n is something of the sort of time divided by the correlation time. And we can see the large times where it is much larger than one. Now, at this point, let us consider really some random variable, which is given by sum of large number n of independent identically distributed random variables. So we consider x, I will use the same notation. I hope there will be no confusion. So we consider kind of mathematical problem. You have random variable, which is sum of large number of independent i, i, d, r, v. That's how we uh, speak of identical uh, independent. We usually use, use abbreviation for this uh, independent, identically distinct random variables. Uh, so you look at this and make an effort and look at it something as you did not study. And assume that you want to find exponential of kx and you did not study central limit theory. Now, what would you do? Well, if you were given that directly, you would say, well, okay, so let us use then a definition. And the next step would be because all xi are independent, then this is average of product, and average of product is product of averages. Moreover, they are identically distributed, so each average is going to be the same. So this is nothing but exponent of kx small to power n. And this is equality, okay? So then you look at it and you ask yourselves, in what sense 
this is kind of this is tentative it must be equal to the prediction of central limit theorem so central limit theorem which we designate by c and t it's again standard notation so uh, let me move it to another line not to get it confused with m here so you ask in what sense this is the same as the prediction of CLT, which is what we wrote previously, exponent kx plus k square over two x square average minus x average square close brackets. And you realize that, well, it does not look the same. It's not only that it does not look the same, it's simply different, okay? There's no reason whatsoever why this would be equal to this. So what is going wrong? Why we were using the theorem, which we were taught that distribution of sums of large number of independent, identically distributed random variables is Gaussian, and yet we see immediately that it's wrong. Uh, the reason is that uh, it's not that central limit is wrong. It's that, uh, of course it's not, it's that you need to understand what it tells you and what it does not. Now, if you recall the formulation of uh, central limit theorem, it tells you that, uh, so you, without any loss, again, you can assume that average of x is zero. And then central limit theorem tells you that in the limit of n going to infinity, one over square root of n x becomes Gaussian, okay? So this variable, which is X divided by square root of number of variables becomes Gaussian. Okay, then it means that if you consider at large enough N X over square root of N, it's approximately Gaussian. And then you loosely say that, well, square root of N is only a constant, so, distribution of x itself is Gaussian. So any uh, rescaling of Gaussian variable, of course, keeps the statistics Gaussian. So this is how you would conclude that x is Gaussian. And it would be OK if you studied limit, uh, well, moments of x of not too high orders. In contrast, moments of x which have high order are going to be determined by the tails of the distribution. So if you would study integral of x to power k, p, uh, so you consider average of x capital K. By definition, this is integral with the probability density function. And if you consider limit of k going to infinity, you would increase the role of large x indefinitely. And then it would mean that you need to know the tail of the distribution. And the tail is actually non gauge there is no reason why it would be Gaussian. And if you look at the derivations, you see that the tail is missed by the uh, Gaussian central, by the central limit theorem. And the same thing holds if you made an average, if you considered average of exponential of kx. Because exponential, so to say, involves as high powers of x as you, as you wish, which means that this average is uh, again, sensitive uh, uh, to the tails of the distribution. It is determined by the tails, uh, and it's again not describable by the central limit theorem. It does not mean that central limit theorem is wrong, because still you would have, say, identity for low order moment of x. It would still be true that uh, it is approximately uh, obeys this Gaussian relation that it's three times. Uh, average of x square squared. Okay, so you need to understand where you can use central limit theorem and where you cannot. So it is something which is not uh, kind of used to be be uh, to be used blindly. So okay, having all this, what do we do? So how do you describe these tails? Is there any way to do so? Uh, fortunately, there is at least not very far tails can be described with so called large deviations theory, uh, which I will introduce here. So, 
Uh, are there any questions? Any remarks? Yes, I do have one actually. Sorry. Yes. Um, it's most out of curiosity. Uh, isn't it possible to work with the logarithm instead of with the exponential and then apply central limit theorem and do the exponential back? So work with a variable that is the logarithm. Doesn't exist something like that? I have no idea. Mm. Uh, can you expand on your question because I didn't understand it? Yeah. Okay. So you do. You. I'm thinking about the, instead of working directly with generals. Uh, lie up enough exponent you apply uh, the logarithm so you work with the logarithm and then you don't have the exponential anymore so try to apply the ah okay so so say if the distribution of logarithm of x yeah. is uh, log normal yeah exactly yeah so you can isn't it possible to work with log of x instead of with uh, with x and then apply the yes however uh, you always need to know for which quantities uh, for average of which quantities you could use the log normal approximation it would still be the same thing it's kind of you by relabeling things you don't change the reality that this cannot be calculated okay as Gaussian. okay so uh, <coughs> We are uh, so the large deviation theory tells you this. Now, there is a way to derive it kind of uh, directly, uh, but let me do it in a way which is uh, a bit different. Which is, I'll show you the result, and you will see that it must be like that. Okay, so the result is that probability density function of x is actually describable with the help of so-called large deviations function. And asymptotically in the limit of large M, it is given by minus M S of X of M, where, so M goes to infinity and S is large deviations function. It is also called Kramer function it is also called entropy function. So let me give you all the names so you know them. Uh, this is a quantity which occurs over and over in non equilibrium statistical physics. And in fact, the name entropy function is uh, not something which uh, is uh, you don't know. So if you uh, recall your studies of equilibrium statistical physics, which is, uh, uh, there is there, uh, well, I hope that you studied it uh, because it's not uh, in the first course of statistical physics where you consider these things often. So there is famous Einstein formula, which tells you that probability of uh, some uh, deviation of a macroscopic uh, extensive variable is actually given by the entropy exponential of entropy where entropy is considered as a function of that variable. so this is uh, einstein formula it's very useful it is quite simple in fact to understand because by definition uh, it, when you consider equilibrium statistical physics you use microcanonical ensemble then probability to have a given value of a macroscopic variable is simply the number of microscopic states which are compatible with the value x of that variable. And the number of states is uh, nothing but exponential of entropy because entropy is logarithm of the number of states. So in some sense, the formula by Einstein is uh, tautological when you accept the formula by Boltzmann that entropy is logarithm of number of states. Uh, what was of course non-trivial is that uh, this was not so much understood uh, despite that Boltzmann formula came before, uh, you needed to use it. And this is what uh, Einstein actually did in this way. So uh, 
the idea there was that you can consider entropy not only as a function uh, as kind of equilibrium value but also as a function of value of macroscopic fluctuation. So I will not go into these details. You are advised to read uh, London Lifts uh, Volume 5 if you're interested. Uh, they have good exposition of this. Uh, all right, so this statement, let us uh, uh, see that this statement actually is true by considering moments of uh, x, of exponentials of x. So you see that uh, you understand that if you know averages of exponential of kx for any k, more or less it means that you know the probability density function because it's kind of Fourier transform. It's Fourier transform in imaginary variable and uh, for faster uh, decaying probability density functions, which are the functions which we will consider, it's simply equivalent to the Fourier transform. So uh, let us simply verify this formula. Are there any remarks, questions, anything? Okay, so we consider this random variable and we know that exponent of kx small to power n equals average of exponential of kx capital. This we know. And then by definition, it must be equal to the exponent of kx, e of x, dx. Okay. And that must be in turn, if this formula is true, it must be equal asymptotically to exponential of kx capital minus m s x n d x okay so let us see if this is true uh, for starters we can introduce the variable which is x over n so let me designate it with uh, so we introduce x capital over n. Let me again use the same notation x small for kind of obvious reasons. Uh, so this is integral exponent kx minus, uh, so let me take immediately n out. So it's exponential n kx small minus s of x small d uh, x small times n okay so then you look at this and you realize that in the limit of large n this is again integral which is determined by the maximum so asymptotically this is equal To exponential of n times maximum value over x of kx minus s of x. So you compare both sides of this uh, identity by taking, say, a logarithm of both sides, and you see that logarithm of this is proportional to n and logarithm of this is proportional to n. So we find that it is true, this identity is true provided that logarithm exponential of kx equals maximum over x of kx minus s of x. Okay. So uh, then this is our conclusion. We find that if we pick S according to this equality, so the right-hand side is a function of K. And if S obeys this equality, then we are okay. We can reproduce this uh, asymptotic equality. And actually this confirms that this large deviations uh, uh, form 
is true. Uh, occasionally, uh, some of you might uh, recognize in this combination something which is uh, uh, well known, uh, which you use all the time in thermodynamics. And again, there's a good reason for that because this S in some uh, circumstances uh, has the actual interpretation of entropy. So uh, does any of you recognize how we call this want, uh, this type of quantity? Okay, so let me, uh, give, well, this is about simple names. So of course I will not request an answer. So it means that uh, you can write this using the, uh, the wording that S of X is the Legender. So you all studied Legender transformation. So it's Legender transform of logarithm exponent of Kx. Okay, so uh, this is a very simple prediction. It means that if uh, you study distribution of this sum, you want to have uh, the description of this probability density function at large n, you can use these answers. Now, what remains is to understand how this relates to the properties which you know very well about the sums, which is law of large numbers and central limit theorem itself. So for law of large numbers, you observe that you need to consider x over n. And to derive the law of large numbers, you need to recognize some properties of S. Uh, okay, unfortunately I was, uh, well, let me do it for the next lecture. So on this lecture, I want to finish this picture. We have still one minute, so I'll use it. Uh, so uh, in this case, you can show then that if you consider probability density function of a finite time lapse of its model, which is by definition one over t integral from zero to t and sigma n, which is simply telling you what is stretching local stretching rate. So if you consider it as a function of x, this is local rate of stretching of pairs of trajectories. So it allows you to know how the stretching factor by time t, uh, time t depends on initial position of pairs. And then this large deviation form, as you can readily convince yourselves, tells you that volumes of regions where stretching rate is given by some lambda one, uh, let me designate it by sigma. So let not to get confused with lambda of exponents. So I'll designate it by sigma one. Well, we already have that sigma, which is usual difficulty. So let's call it five. Okay. So then the distribution is given by exponential minus t s of phi. So s of phi is large deviation function, which tells you volume fraction of stretching rates. Uh, so volume fraction of initial positions of pairs where stretching rate is phi is given by exponential minus t times s of phi. So this gives you this already infinity of possible stretching rates, possible values of this phi. And for each value of this stretching rate phi, you have appropriate, assi appropriately assigned volume fraction where this uh, stretching rate holds. And that volume fraction depends on phi and it is given by exponential of minus t times life deviation function of phi. So we will talk in detail about this prediction. Uh, and then we will talk about other applications of large deviation theory, which is in fact extremely useful in turbulence. So we'll discuss also dissipation in this language and some other properties. Uh, if there are no questions, then we finish for today. Uh, any questions, remarks, please send me by email or in chat or in any other form. I have a question, but um, yes, you're recording these sessions. Uh, there will be any chance of seeing this. 
again at some stage? Uh, well, there, there, is the, there are these links which I am sending you each day with uh, links to recording. Uh, so you're asking if they're going to be permanently available somewhere? Yes. Uh, well, that's, uh, I would, of course, uh, prefer that it would be like that. We need uh, to speak with uh, the organizers. So if Marco is here, maybe. Uh, so I guess it depends on regulations of uh, uh, Beckham. So uh, uh, Marco, are you here? OK, so I'll speak with the organizers and then. Uh, yes, sorry if I can ah. interrupt you. Yeah. I think they could be, the link will be available. The, the, I think there is no right to download the, the lecture, but it should be available on the cloud uh, for future uh, uh, to look at in, in, in the detail. But I don't know for how long time. So I will try to find out with administration. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, it's hack and uh, yes. maybe Marco. I'm I'm not getting if you, if you're sending links and uh, emails uh, these days. I'm really not getting uh, any of them. Uh, so I don't know if maybe I'm not in the mail list for the for the course because um, I didn't receive the original uh, link for the. Uh, did Did you register for the course? I did. I did. Oh, really? okay, we will uh, we will uh, we will talk to Itor. Perhaps there was yeah. A, there perhaps was... I register later uh, than I should have, or something like that. It's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but I did uh, complete the form online. Anyways, I, I can send you an email and uh, yeah, please. Send maybe you can include me on the list. To me, copy Itor and uh, it's also. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we finished for today. Thank you.